Okay, uh, but thanks again for uh, having me, and thanks again for coming this morning to the talk. Uh, sorry for being late. Apparently, lunches here are really long. Uh, I did not know, so we went a little bit longer than anticipated. Excuse me, excuse me. Yes. Um, you can speak uh, more slow. Yes. Yes. slow. Yes. Uh, but because, uh, uh, for example, I don't speak uh, in English very fluently. Of course. Uh, so I will speak slow. Did I, did I do okay in the talk today? Was that okay? <laughs> All right, well, you, you seem to laugh at the right time, so I, I thought I was doing okay, but I, I'll make sure. Thank you for telling me. I will slow down. Okay. Uh, of course, of course. Uh, so uh, Marcos is coming back with some materials to help us get started, but we can get going anyways. Um, so what we're going to do today, and we're going to go till 5.30, so about an hour and 45 minutes. Uh, we'll take a break in between. We're moving around, so it won't be too, uh, won't be here stuck together for that too long. Um, but I want to try to save a lot of time for questions and just discussion, um, and we can do that as we're going. Uh, but we can save time at the end too, because I think um, having in, you know the whole time just doing a certain activity is useful. But it's even more useful sometimes just to talk and back and forth. So we'll do a lot of that too. Um, and what we're going to do today is uh, focus on the research part of teaching. Uh, as I mentioned in the talk today, we want to think about not just how to use these types of teaching practices, but we want to think about are they working or not. And that's the idea of um, what's called DEBER, Discipline-Based Education Research. So I'll define that more for you uh, in a little bit. Um, first, though, any opening questions, comments from the colloquium, or any other thoughts uh, about anything? Uh, I have a question. Uh, um, it's about uh, uh, how the uh, active learning uh, contributes to um, to uh, wor works uh, about um, the. Um, uh, scientific formation in a secondary context. Okay. So you're asking kind of like how, why does it work? Uh, or, oh, okay, why? Why does it work? Okay, so, so that's, the, that's the next big question really, is we, we, have, we have evidence that active learning works, but we don't really know why it works, you know? So you can think about a, um, and maybe designing a new drug that it's able to you know, stop this tumor growth, but the mechanism isn't really sorted out yet. But that might not be a reason to not use the drug. Maybe we still want to use it, right? So, I mean, that's a little more different because there could be side effects and potential issues with the whole body, right? Uh, but in terms of this, yeah, we, we again, we know that it does work, but the actual mechanism for why, we're still working that out. So researchers in our field are calling that um, active learning 2.0 research. Hey, we, we've kind of established the, the what. The yes, it does work, but the why, the mechanism is still coming out. Um, and trying to rely on people in the psychological sciences and cognitive sciences to try to think about how the brain actually learns. Why does this kind of stimulate that? We're still, I, I don't have a solid answer for that yet. That's a great question to ask, and that's the next kind of stuff we're going to be looking at. Okay, great. Yes. Uh, I don't think or related with that yeah. question, there are some articles, I, I, I was thinking you would say that, uh, saying that what you hear, you remember only 10%, and then what you write, you remember a little bit more, and then the active learning is because we are doing, listening, sure. speaking, and that's why we fix that in the brain. Yeah, so there are some, you know, I, I haven't found like a, a single article that puts that all together. A lot of that I think is still kind of anecdotal with the percents, but I totally agree with it, right? You know, you, you um, if you think about what's the best way to learn something, and I ask my students this in, in class sometimes, you start at like the worst way. What do, you, what do you think? What would be the worst way to learn and remember something? The worst. The worst, the lowest. Like that, you'll remember. You will remember the least amount from learning something this way. Just reading. So okay, so just passive reading. Okay, that's an option. What else? Repetitions. Say that again. Words repetitions. Okay, repetitions. Maybe. 
Is that learning by heart? Learning by heart, so not just basic memorizing. But how are you doing that? Are you reading it? Are you listening to somebody lecture to you, right? So what we try to say is that those types of things are more on the bottom, especially the lecture, because the lecture is, is temporal. It's only there for that period of time. Some people will record it, and then you could watch it online again and again, or listen to it. But uh, oftentimes, you're in class for 45 minutes, the lecture happens, and then it's gone, right? So learning from that is really well. Reading is a little bit better, because you can at least go back again and again, you go at your own pace, things like that. Um, so if those kind of are on the bottom, what do you think are on the other end of the, the best ways to learn? That from doing something, what are those? What are those things you can do that would help you learn the best? Hands on. So actually doing things, activities, sure. Yeah. Thinking in, uh, with other uh, partners, uh, thinking about solving the problem. Great. So not just individual doing, but group doing. Great. Is a question or resolve question? Okay. So asking questions and then you know, seeing if you find the answer to that. Great. Yeah. Writing. He's speaking and writing to you. Okay, so writing out as you're thinking and learning through it, okay. So those are all great and they're all definitely better than the lecture or the reading. Um, well, I think many would argue, especially people that are instructors would agree, is that teaching is the best way to learn. Because like, I, I don't really, you know, the first time I ever taught, for example, um, you know, uh, cardiovascular physiology and the way the cardiac cycle works and the electrical activity of the heart. I read about it, I kind of, I had a class about it 15 years ago, <laughs> but I had to go in front of 35 people and teach it. I don't really know what I'm doing until I'm able to go up there and run a class about that, right? So teaching is really the best way to learn. Um, I, 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 this quote is attributed to Einstein, I don't know if it's true, but he says you never really know something unless you can explain it well to your grandmother. Right? Um, so if you can, assuming your grandmother is not a theoretical physicist, um, right? So if you can do that, then you really know it. Um, so teaching's by far the high end, but and that goes along with what a lot of you were saying: testing yourself, doing group work, talk, explaining to each other, writing summaries. Right? You're kind of testing yourself, teaching, seeing through teaching in a way if you know it or not. The other way that's really important too, which came up a little bit, is um, the idea of practice or repetition, right? So, um, who is the best Mexican football player right now? It's controversial. Oh, it's controversial. Right. Is there? What's that? It is not chicharito. Not chicharito. <laughs> is there someone we can agree on that's one of the best? No. Let's pick Chicharito, because that's the only name you gave me. All right. He's probably pretty good, maybe. Okay. So for him to get better at shooting penalty kicks, right, um, or penalty shots, do you think he reads a book about it? No. Do you think he watches videos of other people doing it? Maybe. Maybe. Do you, maybe he watches videos of himself doing it? Maybe. Does he actually get there on the pitch and kick the ball? Yeah. He actually does it, right? He's actually doing it. So that's what we, I try to tell my students, too. That if you really want to learn biology or physics or chemistry or engineering, whatever, you actually have to do it. So that idea of practice and doing is really important for learning, too. Um, so that is a long way to go to your point about the 10% uh, the doing, read, you know, seeing, whatever. But there is some truth in that, right? The more active you are with doing stuff, practicing, testing yourself, and then again at the highest end with teaching, that's really going to help you check yourself to see if you really know something or not. So when I try to help my students with studying, I tell them don't, don't just reread the book, don't uh, just look at the pictures in the book. Um, be active. So get a blank piece of paper, draw a plasma membrane, draw the components of the electron transport chain, model what happens. Oh, uh, or in say photosynthesis, photosystem one stopped working. What's going to happen now? You can predict and apply that way, right? You can, um, I, you know, with, with learning objectives, which you might have covered in other sessions, I'm not sure, but learning objectives are things like I had at the beginning of the talk today. These are things you can actually do. So. Um, you can test yourself, can I do this objective or not? If I can do it, great. If I can't, 
I need to go back and fill in some gaps, right? So doing, again, is kind of the, the much better than the more passive stuff. Um, and that probably goes back to why this all works to some extent. But I think, again, we're researchers are still trying to tie in that cognitive, psychological, and education triangle, if you will, to figure out exactly why it's working. Um, cool. Any other opening questions, comments? Yeah? Have you identified some factors of the culture of certain population that lower the impact of the active learning? Uh, lower the impact, conflict? meaning it's not working as well? If I lower the impact, is that what you mean? Uh, yes. Not working as well? Um, that's interesting, yeah, because as in any science, um, replication is really important. Right? So if you find a really great discovery with HeLa cells in your lab, you can publish a paper on it, but that's not going to radically change your field unless someone in America does it, someone in Germany does it, right? someone in Australia does it. Well, if you have other people replicate your work, then it's more valid. Right? It's, it has a much more stronger claim to that, for that evidence. Um, same thing with teaching. right? The things that I talked about today and what you're learning in these workshops have been shown to be effective in multiple cases, but they have to be tried with your own population, your own students, your own constraints, your own culture, right? Not everything will port over exactly the same, right? So just because the reading guides work for me and the way I've implemented them, they might not work at, um, you know, one of the national universities here in introductory biology for, I don't know why, but they might not, right? So you have to try replicating things with your group. And then if it doesn't work as well, or if it works better, you got to try to figure out why that is, right? And it's hard to say um, exactly why one thing, you know, more in a general sense. Um, however, I'll say from having taught at Irvine for five years, and now I've been in Colorado for a year and a half, I have noticed things working slightly differently. Uh, the biggest thing revolves around teaching biology. Um, do we have any engineers in the room? A couple, okay, and then any biologists? Okay, most of you, and then the rest, sorry, other, other disciplines do we have? Biochemists. Biochemists, great. Biochemistry. Psychology. Psychology. Veterinary. Veterinary, okay, great. Anyone I missed? Physician. Physician. Okay, so most of you are on the bio, bio side. Um, then we have a couple of the engineers here as well. Um, so what I've observed, and you might agree with me, engineers, um, is that engineering students in general are not as excited about biology as biology <laughs> students. Yeah, okay. Don't say it here. Uh, okay. So I mean, when I was in college, you know, almost 20 years ago, I was a chemical engineer. We didn't really like biology that much. Um, when I was in graduate school, even though I was in bioengineering, the basic biology classes, the biochemistry course we took, eh, we didn't really like it that much. <laughs> but we liked the design, we liked the quantitative, we liked that kind of stuff, right? Um, now the biologists in the room, uh, any of you do, you, and I'm just joking around here, but do any of you absolutely love math? <laughs> okay, right, so it's commonly thought that biology students don't really like math, okay? And so this goes to the population issue now, right? So I taught introductory biology for five years to biology students, students who wanted to be vets and nurses and doctors and, and all sorts of things like that. And then I taught, and now I've taught biology for a year and a half to engineering students. Things don't work the same, right? So in, in Irvine, with my, my, my biology students, I would have all sorts of case studies and examples about human health and diseases and, and uh, potential drug treatments and all this stuff. I used the, and I would get great, you know, 800 eyeballs, things were all going awesome, right? People were really excited about it and seemed to really connect with the students. I used the exact same lessons when I taught introductory biology in, in Colorado with the engineering students. They could care less. You know, it was just a total difference. So now that's a content kind of uh, difference in terms of um, an example you use. So it's not necessarily the, the teaching method. I still use active learning. I still use high structure with my engineering students. Um, and that seems to be working quite well. But the way things are presented, in my case, had differed based on my two populations. Um, so with that in mind, you do, you do definitely have to consider just because something worked in one way in a publication at this university with these students, it might not work exactly the same in your hands. So you have to try it first, replicate it, and then again, evaluate. Is it working? Is it not working? Any other questions? Yeah. Um, 
and that's what we're going to actually get through today, talking about is it working or not. Great. Good. Anything else to start? Yeah. I'm a little bit curious about like you. You said that in in Colorgill, you can provide some material content uh, books. Oh, uh, references. That, that oh, sure. Services. Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I I can give you. I will. How about I email it to Marcus and he can send you a PDF with a bunch of resources uh, to kind of. And that's going to be more on the <coughs> the research side. But I can put some stuff in there on the active learning side too. Yeah. And the teaching side, yeah, would that be helpful? All right. I'm sure you already have stuff you're sharing, but I'll, I'll get you my list. So, Absolutely. yeah, I will get that to you guys soon, of course. Great. Okay, so how about we uh, transition into this a little bit and uh, get started? Um, and again, yeah, we have plenty of time, so. All right, perfect. Perfect. Um, before we do anything else, though, I, I would like to. Um, uh, get your names if you don't mind to help me learn as we're going. I know we don't have that much time together, but it would really help. So if we could just pass these out. And we, can we see so, yeah. Right, so yeah, we'll just pass these out. If you guys could just make a little name tag, and maybe you can um, you can kind of bend it like this so that it sits up, right? So they can see your name. That'd be great. That'd be great. So, you can. Important for teaching anything, but even for a workshop, they're important so you know what you're going to be doing. Um, so by the end of this workshop, you should be able to describe what discipline-based education research is, or deeper, uh, compare and contrast deeper with traditional scientific research, uh, explain the key factors of a deeper study, and then design your own deeper study to try in your own class in the future. All right, so first though, um, let's think about what types of organisms do you study right now? So just go ahead and shout them out. What kind of an, uh, organisms are you using to study? If you're, if you're in biology, mice, mice, yeast, mice, rats, microorganisms, so maybe bacteria, E. coli, things like that. Plants, Plants great. Yes. Cell cultures, good. Yeah, axolotl. Oh, use axolotl. They're so cute. I love it. Uh, a guy I worked with in North Carolina had a pet one in his office in a tank. It's so cute. Um, are they really? Are they really common here? Axolotl? Yes, they are endemic from here. I know they're from Mexico, but are they? Would you walk to the lakes and rivers and they're just no. hanging out? No. 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 <laughs> they're in the labs now. No. Okay. There's some labs. Okay. Great. Um, Okay, and then, then I know then we have a couple engineers. You're probably not. Are you bioengineering or other types? So you're probably not doing anything alive. All right. Anything yeah. biochemistry? Okay, you're biochemistry. Okay. Me, well, I studied um, master in human ecology, so oh. we yeah. work with communities of humans. Okay, so human ecology <laughs> to human studies. Yeah, okay, <laughs> right. And we're going to talk about humans uh, here in a second too. But so these are some of the ones you named that I know you would. So again, microorganisms, bacteria. Uh, yeast, uh, cell cultures, these are HeLa cells, but you can take your pick, CHO, HMK, whatever. And then the, the vertebrates, so the mice and the rats. Okay. Uh, so what I want you to discuss with each other now, though, is how are these organisms different from your students? <laughs> so go ahead, chat with each other, take, take a minute. How are they different from your students? Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, so what did you discuss? So what did you discuss? How are they different? You can control them. Okay, is that Israel? Okay, so you can control them. Right. Yeah. So you can control these easily, right? Uh, you cannot really control people. Um, yes. they, they, you do what you want for a large extent. So you can control diet, light dark cycles. Uh, you can even control their genetics, right? You can give them a gene, take a gene away, right? All things like that. Whereas people, right, uh, very different from that respect. Okay, good. Um, what else? How are they different? What did you discuss? Let's hear one from each row. So this row was taken care of this time, so we have three more rows. <laughs> students you can actually have conversations with them and get in from learn things get information the rat though the best you can do is observe its behavior you know watching it and then you'll probably you know take tissue samples but you cannot actually get direct feedback from it is it in pain is it hungry stuff like that right? okay good good okay so we have two more rows much harder yes yeah, sure so, uh, right on yeah. yeah. So Raynan said you cannot really take tissue samples from your students, <laughs> right? Um, you can have studies that would allow for consent for that, but usually that's a lot harder, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, 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 no. No, not enough possible. Not enough possible. Okay. And one more back here, last row. And what I just I, mean, I think uh -huh. that we cannot experiment with the people's like it's a life, you know, like, mm -hmm. but the rats and other things like we can do some new experiments and then. Without doing anything, we can replace with other students. Okay, great. Yeah, you need. Uh, okay. So, okay, great. Uh, so, some said, um, right? Uh, so, with humans, right, you can't really try more extreme experiments unless maybe it's a really severe terminal disease case where people want to, right? But with animals, right, again, we have the control over them. They can't really say. I mean, of course, there's approval for animal work and you have to make sure you're doing things ethically um, and humanely, but there's definitely more freedom with that. Okay, and, all, and those last comments are really great because they kind of led into the next question I have, which is how would studying these organisms then be different from studying your students? So you guys already picked up a couple of those, but keep discussing that a little bit more. How would studying these organisms be different from studying your students? Okay, let's discuss this one now. And we'll do the same thing, kind of different rows, but we'll have different people say it. Different people talk this time. So, all right, so how would studying them be different? Yeah, Hector? Behavioral response. Uh huh. 
Sure. So, be, and how like, can you elaborate a little bit more what you mean by that? And the, the human response are, is more complex than the animal. Okay. So Hector said the behavior responses are much more complex in a human mm -hmm. compared to, a, say, a, a yeast or a mouse. Um, also, we, to the uh, Rocio's point, is that we can kind of we can verbalize our responses to these treatments, right? Whereas the animals and um, uh, yeast and things cannot. So that's a great one. Okay, what else? They can predisposition. They can have a predisposition. And yeah. If they say uh, no, that uh, they are studying by this professor. Great. Yeah. So uh, Laura. Right. So Laura said that students can have you know. Uh, uh, preconceptions or their own thoughts they have we, we have brains right we can control kind of our fate we can choose to be in a study or not we can choose how to behave in a study you know if you're in a uh, uh, when I was in college they had um, uh, a, a research group was studying effects of something on diet I forget what it was but they paid you a little bit of money you know to be a subject but that you had to keep a log of everything you ate was I telling the truth? Maybe, right? You don't know, right? But, but an animal, again, you can control their diet, whereas a human, it's kind of up to the, the human subject to, to be telling the truth or to be responding correctly, right? So that can definitely vary. All right. All right. Front row, back row? Yeah. Is that Ulysses? Uh, maybe in the lab, you can control the diversity mm -hmm. of the, the organisms right. to, to, to be less than So Ulysses said in the lab, again, you have control over the diversity of your organisms, right? If you want a, your entire animals to be genetically identical, you can do that. If you want them to be two populations differing by you know, one snip, you could do that, right? With you guys, with us, no way, right? We, we, we're coming from all sorts of backgrounds, all sorts of uh, ideas and thoughts and uh, upbringings and levels of education and cultural experiences, there's no way to make things uniform with folks. I like to say that it's really hard to study students because US students are not genetically identical mice, right? It makes it much more difficult. So good point there, Yes. Yeah. Uh, so my, my research project involves a clinical trial. So I am actually dealing with, with humans. So even if you have a inclusion criteria or exclusion criteria, uh, you have all that diversity. Yeah. And even if you, don't, you want to control the diet or keep records of what you are eating, your exercise activities, etc. Now, <laughs> right now, I am dealing with that kind of diversity. So the, maybe the difference between them and, and students is that I am dealing with patients. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> they have a given pathology and maybe the students don't. <laughs> sure, yeah. So uh, Blanca said again, the, the uh, dealing with patients, like they have some kind of at least a pathology to unite them. But students, again, all over the place, and we can only measure so much uh, to capture something. Um, I didn't, I, we won't really get into it today, but um, what I mentioned in the talk today, how I did what's called a multiple linear regression model, that's kind of the best we can do with looking at student populations because it controls for a bunch of variables that might confound or might be uh, problematic with your analysis, right? So just for example, let's say that in this room, um, we split you into two groups, just arbitrarily, um, you know, the back two rows and the front two rows, right? Just arbitrarily split into two groups, and I gave you both a test. And let's say the front group did way better than the back two rows. Sorry, back two rows. Uh, just making it up, right? Just say they did better than the back two rows. So why is that, right? Why was why did the front two rows do better, right? Um, so we can do things to kind of control for all the variability we have in this room, right? So we have gender differences. We have uh, ethnicity difference, cultural differences. Um, you probably all scored differently on your standardized tests or entrance exams for graduate school, things like that. We can include that. Uh, we can include where you grew up as a measure of socioeconomic status, where you went to high school. So there's all these things we can include, and then you put all of that into one mathematical model that can then test for the true variable we're assessing here, which is front of the room versus back of the room. Right? So just on raw, by chance, the front of the room could do better than the back of the room. But when we control for all these variables, again, just making this up, but let's say the front two rows did much better in university than the back two rows. 
Well, that might explain why they did better on this test, right? But if you only compared front versus back, like a bar graph, you're missing a lot of the story, right? So that's where these, these, these models come into play and why they're really important for studying um, uh, students or learning. It's a very common tool in social science research of any kind. Okay, so we hit on some of the big ways that they're different. Um, anything else that we didn't touch on you wanted to share? Maybe we can get emotions. Sorry, it's not. Maybe we can get emotions like the participants, they have emotions that will be as sad. Oh, emotions. Yeah, and another thing, emotions, right? So we can actually characterize that in humans and students through different surveys or instruments. But again, in animals and other model organisms, no. Am I doing okay with the speed of talking? Okay, again, please tell me if I'm not. Okay. All right. Okay, so let's let's do some more comparisons here now. So what if um, you thought about using mice? Let's say we're doing a study with mice now. And who who again are using vertebrates like mice here? A couple of you? Rats, rats or mice? A couple? Okay. So you can be the you can help out in your rows. But so what are the important elements? when you're designing a study with mice. It could be any kind of study, so in your you know, small groups in your rows, think about what you want to study with mice. What are the important things to consider with mice? So go ahead and discuss. Go ahead and discuss. Okay, I'll stop you there again. So, what are some things that are really important to consider when studying mice or yeast or whatever organism you want to think about? Yeah, age. Age, great, the age of the organism. Okay, great, great. And, what did you say? Okay, great. Uh, said the age of the animals, again, the, the sex of the animals, so male or female. And so you can easily control that. You'll have all Three month old mice equal male, female, or all male, right? You can easily control that. Good, good. Okay, because those might affect whatever you're studying. Okay, okay what else? Um, um, yeah, so as Judy said, the genetic genetics of the animals, so they might have. Uh, predispositions to certain disorders like epilepsy you mentioned they might have certain uh, effects of diet on the, based on their genetics right? so you can control for that again right you can order mice from you know Ch uh, Charles uh, the Charles River the lab right you can order your mice that are all the exact same genetics and you're done right again we can't do that with humans all right um, that'd be that's for a, a movie someday like have you seen Gattaca yeah, okay, that's uh no, you, you've not seen any Ulysses? Okay, yeah, it's a, it's a sci-fi movie about, um, 95. it's from 95, it is old, it is old, it's a good movie, um, it's um, about basically genetic engineering of people to kind of select for certain traits, right, so the people that were really rich and affluent, when they have children, they can pick the genes they want in their children, they grow up to be the, the, the perfect humans, and, and so there's a whole story with it, it's really good. Yeah, um, and if you if you know the, the title is Gattaca, it only uses the basis of DNA, A, G, C, and T in the title. I don't know. It's kind of cool. <laughs> Sci-fi nerdy stuff. I like it. Okay. Uh, so okay. So that was a good one. What else do we have? The food. The weight. Like the yeah, uh, food. Oh, the food. In, yeah. uh, organics of model fat mm -hmm. is very important 
Great, so as Edson said, the diet again, right? We can control what they eat, so if we're, especially if we're affecting anything physiologically, we want to make sure they're eating the same stuff, okay? Right. The space where they are... Great, great, yeah. Can I put this card? Yeah, so, Ariadna. Ariadna. So Ariadna said where they live, right? Living spaces. You can't tell the students where to go home at night, right? I mean, they're, they're, I mean, maybe they go to the dorms, and maybe they go to the common living space, but you still can't control that. But yeah, the animals, you can tell them where to live, how long the light's on for again, you can control all of that. Good, good. So now, a lot of these environmental things you have control over, and that's usually very important. Because again, if you had two groups of mice and you're testing the effect of a drug, you wouldn't want one group of mice eating a completely different diet and stay, you know, lights on all night in a big, nice cage, and then the other group's totally different, right? That's, there's so many confounding variables there, right? So we gotta eliminate those. All right, now then, again, with humans, same thing now. So now, what are, and some of these things we've already acknowledged. We can't control genetics of our students, right? We can't control what they eat or where they live. So what is the kind of best you can do at this point? What are the important things you can consider and try to design a study with your students. So what can you try to control? What can you try to measure? What can you try to control for? So go ahead and discuss that again. How would you, what's important when designing a study with your students? Okay, so what about our students? What's the what can we consider? What can we try to control for? Yeah. Uh, 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 likes and dislikes, uh, uh, interest of the students about uh, the learning of the science. Okay, okay so uh, their interest levels. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, and we can measure that, right? We there are surveys or other tools that we can use to have them write down or on a scale or like the, like uh, tools. Uh, that you use in the colloquium, for example, mm -hmm. uh, to, to ask uh, for a course uh, if uh, what uh, topics uh, like um, most like than others uh, topic. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. There's, and there's a, but the great thing too is that a lot of these tools already exist. So and we'll talk about that later. You don't have to make up your own every time, which is really powerful. Yeah. Okay. Right, so another hand. Anyone? Yeah. Maybe the amount of time we have available to apply the activity or the mm -hmm. Great, yeah. So uh, Benito said, you know, if you're trying an active learning technique, you can control how much time you give it to them, right? So let's say you had two classes, two sections of a class. If you do an active learning activity that takes 15 minutes in the one section, the other section, you should probably do something else for that exactly 15 minutes, right? So that way you can control the length of the intervention, and that's affecting our students. So that's a really good point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, learning from, if you learn to read or doing. Say that again, one. Uh, uh, one more time. Sorry. Okay. Uh, can you just say your okay. your time again? Uh, What's your uh, name? Uh, learning from. Mm -hmm. Learning from. Mm -hmm. If the student learn to read or doing? Okay, so how they, what they prefer to learn by. Okay, yeah, so learning preferences, right? Yeah, we can measure that and kind of in our in our eventual analysis, we can say, well, you might prefer to learn through reading, you might prefer from videos, and we can actually include that as a factor in our analysis. Sure. Yeah. The motivation? Yeah, yeah, Monica said motivation. Yeah, that's a big one, 
right? And that's something, I don't know if you picked up on that from the part of my talk today, with the reading guides, I didn't mention it, but I talked about it in the paper, um, we didn't assess motivation at all. So you can imagine that the students who are doing the reading guides, they're just you know, more motivated to do well, and the reason they're doing well is actually because they're more motivated, not because of the reading guides, right? Um, so we weren't able to, to control for that factor, but that is something you can pick up on and measure and put into models for studying, for sure. That's a good one, right, Nan? We were talking about the measurements, yeah. because at the end, of all of the studies needs to be measured, mm -hmm. but also we need to check what kind of data we want to obtain, yeah, and right. then hope to use that data to obtain some conclusions. Perfect. And then it's important to know that with, uh, for the study, mm -hmm. because have a lot of information is not well, so we need to have the, the information that we need. Perfect, so. yeah, yeah, and we're gonna talk about uh, types of measurement coming up and types of data you can collect, um, but that's very important. You, you kind of think about what you need and then back from there. Um, do you think uh, time of day matters? Yeah. So let's say, again, you had two sections of introductory uh, chemistry, for example. You teach one at 9 a.m., you teach one at 3 p.m., <laughs> right? A little bit difference, right? Uh, wait, who do you think would do better on it, the 9 or the 3? Nine. 9 would be better, okay. Because three, three's after that long lunch, right? Yeah, that's, that's the problem there, right? Um, uh, also, how did the students get into those sections? Did they, they probably picked, right? Or do you get to pick your own schedules in university? Sometimes. Sometimes, sometimes right? same with us, sometimes. But let's say you have the choice, right? So why are you as a student scheduling at 9 a.m. versus 3 p.m., right? Maybe it's because you're a morning person and you do better in the morning. Maybe it's because, oh, I forgot to register and the only seats that are open are at 3 p.m., right? So you're in a different, so there's a lot of, the time of day actually really matters and we can control for that too, for uh, when, when things are done, when things are tied. Um, so there's a lot of kind of different types of things to consider when studying with your students. Um, going back to your idea, Benito, about trying an active learning activity for a certain length of time, and let's say again, we have the 9 a.m. class and the 3 p.m. class. Do you think the students talk to each other between those classes? Yes. Maybe, right? Yes, maybe. It depends on the, the type of university, maybe, right? In my, ca my case, is I, I teach thermodynamics at 2 o'clock, but my colleague teaches at, teaches at 9 o'clock in the morning, and we cannot use the same quiz. 9 o'clock and 2 o'clock because we know they're friends and they talk to each other, right? <laughs> right? So same thing with this. What if you're trying something new in one section? The students in the other, they're probably going to talk to each other. So there's that crosstalk you have to consider as well. So when you're designing these studies, is it the best thing to split section A and section B and try the treatment in one or the other? Or do you want to try to just take your one section and split it down the middle somehow? It's really starting to be, to be hard about things like this. Is it, would you say it's pretty easy to have a control group with yeast or cells or proteins or mice? To have a control? Yeah, it's easier, it's easier than Definitely easier than humans, right? Yeah, so let's say again you're affecting the, uh, testing the effect of a drug on mouse physiology. Well, one group, all the same age and sex, they get the drug, the other one gets a sugar pill. That's your control group, that's pretty easy, right? With students, not so much, because again, the se if you're comparing section to section, or even within a section, a group of, like if, again, the front rows versus the back rows, there's still so much diversity between that. There's no, no like if I gave you the sugar pill, I gave you in the back the drug, there's so much differences that can contribute to the outcome. So it, the actual control group is much harder to come by in, um, in educational research. Sometimes you don't even need it if you design your study properly. So, uh, and we're going to get into types of studies and things to consider next. But um, uh, good. So that that was kind of just a really big warm up to think about again. How are our students different than your animals, than your cells, than your plants, um, and how we can start thinking about them? So, any other questions, comments at this point? Yeah. Laura? When you have a big group. So difficult to, I don't know, to ask every, everybody and to 
know everybody. Oh, control is over. Oh, so just the kind of level of relationship. Yeah, that's really important. That's really interesting. Um, so you can do, I mean, then I do this with you know 100 students still, and that helps me learn names, but it takes time, and I know, I definitely know the people in the front more than the people in the back, even though I do walk around a lot, like I did in the colloquium too. Um, but those types of behaviors and that relationship is important. Um, I forget what it's called now, but there's this idea of ways that humans connect with each other that actually makes a big impact on motivation and learning. So one is nonverbal, so eye contact. If I'm talking to you and looking at you in the eye, that actually is creating a positive connection. Uh, there's uh, verbal, so things I say to you and talk about. Though also nonverbal is kind of hand gestures and things like that. But there's also something that involves proximity. So again, you guys, if I only stood up here, I'm getting to know you much better than you know, Ulysses way in the back. So the idea of walking around during class actually can benefit everyone because you're showing everyone that you're interested in them, you want to check in on their learning, monitor everything, right? So, um, and again, I forget the, the term for all of this, but um, uh, that there is something to that, for sure, that relationship, right? What if, do, do, um, do you commonly have office hours? Is that a common thing in university? Mm -hmm. So the professor has time, you can go and ask questions in their office, right? Um, so what if you go to office hours all the time, Laura, so I know you really well, you know, but Blanca, you never come, so I only know you from seeing you in class, right? That's a difference right there too, right? So, and that's a lot harder to measure, that's a lot harder to characterize. Do you use uh, media, social media with your students, like Facebook? Um, so social media, I do not. I know people that do. Um, I know people that will have a Facebook page for out of class to ask questions or post content. I know people that have a Twitter uh, line open during class, so people can ask questions during class anonymously. So if there's, because if you have 300 people in the class, you might be a shy and not want to raise your hand. So you could go onto Twitter and post a question and he'll check his phone during class and post those questions on the screen. So um, there are definitely creative ways to use it. I just, I don't use it in my own life, so I, I don't use it in the classroom either. I, I have LinkedIn because I feel like you have to, but other the other stuff, I, Instagram, I don't even know. Like, I know what it is, but I don't know what you do with it, so I guess you guys do that, so that's good. Uh, but yeah, very good points. Okay, all right, so let's think about now um, transitioning to more of the, the actual research. So what is what this term, de Deber? Okay, so Deber, what we mean by this is discipline-based education research. So. You might go to university or graduate school for education, right? You might get a PhD in education. You might get a PhD in psychology. You might get a PhD in educational psychology, right? You are now an expert in education research. So I would consider you an education researcher, okay? I went for a PhD in bioengineering. You're all going for PhDs in a variety of STEM or science and engineering disciplines, right? So you are experts in your discipline as am I. Now you put the two together, so a discipline-based education researcher is someone who is trained in your discipline, so you're a biochemist, uh, you're an engineer, uh, you're a human ecologist, right? all these things, but you're doing education research from that perspective. All right? Versus if you're, again, you go for a PhD in education, you're an education researcher, you can study the learning of biology or chemistry, but you don't have the disciplinary skill or background, right? You probably don't know what the electron transport chain is or how it works, but you are really good at statistics or in, in designing studies, right? And, and understanding the overall cognitive um, way of people learn and, and how education works, right? So there's, there's strengths on both sides. But again, as the Deber side, so I consider myself a Deber person because again, I'm trained as a chemical engineer, a bioengineer, biologist, but I do education research from that vantage point. So I have a, I'm a faculty member in an engineering department right now doing education research. Someone that has the PhD in education, they could study chemical engineering students but they would never, ever be a faculty member in a chemical engineering department because they can't teach thermodynamics. 
right? So it kind of depends on what view you want to take on things. You can both ultimately work together, which is the goal. And that's one thing I want to try to tell you today is make sure you have collaborations with this type of work. Um, but there's, so there's people with the disciplinary expertise again, and then there's people with the kind of methods expertise, and putting them together is really powerful. So um, there's, these are a couple of resources I'll share now, and I'll send these to Marcos later. But there's these two books that are really useful for if you're interested in this stuff, right? If you want to learn more about doing education research from a science or engineering background, these are two books that are excellent. Um, the one on the left is um, a, a very thin book. It's really inexpensive. Uh, and then the one on the right is actually you can download for free as a PDF. And I'll send Marcos these links so you can check them out. But they're really good to kind of get started thinking about how does Deber work, what kind of questions can you ask, where can you publish, what methods can I use, things like that. So I'll, I'll, again, I'll send these to you guys later so you know uh, what the resources are. Uh, but definitely very useful things. Okay, so any questions on kind of what Deber is, why it's different than just education research? I have a question. Yeah. Uh, if you have a discussion with a non-scientist mm -hmm. uh, educator, mm -hmm. maybe a psychologist, did you get along with, it, with him? Oh, do we get along? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, of course, you get along, but the, the psychologists, the education researchers, I'm pretty sure they look down on us, right? That's because, right. Yeah, yeah, because we're not trained in that area, right? But again, we have, we kind of control the populations and we have the disciplinary expertise that we can share with them to give them new information for a study they want to do that they might not be able to do without us, right? So it's definitely, there's definitely a tier of it, you know, right? Like we, I go to conferences that are specific for engineering education or biology education. I don't go to the education conference, like this is the plain education one, because they're, they're up here. And I, I'm not up there. I don't know if I'll ever be up there. But it's just, a di again, it's a different foundation, a different background. But um, I, I think we, I, I work with people that are education researchers. I work with psychologists, and we get along great. Um, but if they looked at the way I would try to do the analysis, they might laugh. Just because I don't have the, the solid foundation in certain types of statistical analyses that they do, right? You know, but, um, but there's definitely partnerships that form. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But it's not easy. Um, well, no, I don't think it, it's sometimes hard to find each other, right? And especially somewhere like here, Sinvestov, I don't think you have a psychology department, do you? Or education department? We have an education department. Oh, you do? Okay. The, okay. the South Campus. Oh, the South Campus. Okay, so other campuses, so that, that's what I recommend is start looking within your own institutions for people in these areas to form partnerships. But it is true that it's really hard to communicate with them. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I invited for this workshop to. A few of them and never managed to have. Oh, yeah, them. okay. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, so. I'm asking the question because I am doing clinical the research, medical, yeah, so yeah. I have to mm -hmm. have discussions with medical yeah, researchers, sure. and it's not easy. So, yeah. They are the well, only people. You know how know, doctors like, are, yeah, right? Just doctors, <laughs> no? So, just you can't understand the, the, the body, no? Yeah. So, I think maybe in this area it's something similar and that's why I'm asking this. Yeah, I, I think it, as long as you don't try to step on their knowledge, right? If you don't, if as long as you don't try to be the expert when you're not, right? Okay. Just defer to them, like they're the clinician, they have the medical expertise, but you're bringing in a different angle, so share your expertise with them. Don't try to diagnose the patients, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, Something yeah, like yeah. that maybe, right? So I think that would help that relationship maybe. Um, so just kind of have those boundaries of where what you're going to contribute, have the, what they're going to contribute, so have a plan for that kind of partnership. And, and that's, I think, and so important with anything you do in research, in life in general, right? It's just having clear expectations from both sides, right? So if that involves, um, you know, your, your research professor, your PI, right? If that involves an undergraduate, maybe you're mentoring, or a younger graduate student you're working with in a lab, um, if that involves a collaborator, right? You gotta have clear expectations. What am I getting out of this? What are you getting out of this? What if we're writing a paper together? Who's gonna be first author? Who's last? You gotta set those things up first. Yeah. So it's, sometimes they're hard conversations to have, but they're really important to ensuring kind of a smooth um, outcome. Yeah. Great. Okay, 
So let me, uh, I just want to tell you a couple of things now. So here are some key factors to consider in a DBRS study, right? Uh, not a lot to, to write down here, but a couple of things I want to share with you. So one is called a theoretical framework, right? So this is the idea that we have some kind of conceptual foundation based on prior evidence and literature to um, support our research. So in other words, what's the basis for doing your study? Right. So if you think about if you're doing a molecular biology study and you're studying um, transcription, right, RNA from DNA, well, that's a pretty strong framework. DNA makes RNA. We have tons of evidence to support that. We can now design a study based on that model or that framework. right? You want to have something similar for DBIRT or for education research. They're much more difficult to come by. Often in the literature, people don't use them. I myself have been guilty of not using them, but I'm sharing this with you now because this is as a field in general of deeper, we're trying to become better researchers, try to get to those education research goals, and theoretical frameworks are really important. So I'll send you some re references as well for, to look more about these, but it's basically what's the underlying phenomena or um, area of education that you're going to be building your study off of. So, Going back to Christian's first question today, was like, why does active learning work, right? So we have a large body of evidence now that active learning has been shown to promote learning. But why is that? So that's our theoretical framework. Active learning works. But now we're going to say why. And here's my specific question to assess why. Right? So a theoretical framework is really important for kind of grounding your study in reality. Um, next is your experimental, des experimental design. We've talked about this a little bit. Um, do you have a control group or a comparison group? Do you even need one? What are these factors to consider? Time of day, demographics, aptitude, test scores, like all this other stuff, right? You have to think about what's going into your experimental design. How are you going to set it up? Um, the study population is also very important. So who are you studying, right? If you're interested in looking at the effects of a certain active learning intervention on um, first year university students, well, you might need to be a little more specific. Is it first-year university students in a biology class? Is it first-year university students in the north of Mexico versus the south of Mexico? Right? You have to think about, again, who your population is and be specific with that, as that's going to help, again, help you understand your results going forward. Um, data collection is very important here. So I mentioned earlier there are existing tools for a lot of this stuff. So are you using an existing, we use the word instrument, for a survey or, a, or something you collect data on, we call them instruments. Um, so are you using an existing instrument or are you making a new one? If you're making up a brand new instrument, that's gonna re require a lot more work to kind of show to the community that it's valid to be used. I'll share an example of that next. Versus if you're using something that's existing, like motivation stuff. Their motivational theory goes back decades to the 70s, um, and there's very well established instruments that will measure students' motivation that you can then adapt for your own purposes. So if you're considering measuring something like motivation, emotions, values, attitudes, things like that we think are more qualitative, you might want to look for existing stuff first rather than just make your own list of questions. Um, same goes for content knowledge too though. So there's, there's things that are called concept inventories. And these are maybe 20-ish multiple choice questions that assess students' knowledge about a certain discipline or a certain field. So there's a concept inventory for um, uh, evolution. There's a concept inventory for developmental biology. They kind of get the big questions in these fields. So you can make your own test of 20 questions about Evo Devo, but maybe you find something that's already out there and use that instead. That's probably a better way to do it. Uh, and then lastly as well here, we have the methods. So the data analysis methods are really important here. Um, so the question there is, do you know statistics well? We often need to use somewhat complicated statistics to analyze our data, especially because we're not genetically identical mice. So what's the best way to design that study, and therefore what's the best way to analyze those data? And it often involves more, it more involves statistical models than um, a certain, you know, plus minus type of drug, no drug treatment in a, in a medical setting. So, okay, so those are some things to keep in mind here. 
Okay. So, any questions on any of these kind of? Uh, okay. uh, I have a, um, a question. Um, okay. The uh, Diver study uh, is uh, for Diver study is more important uh, that the students learn uh, STEM topics mm -hmm. or how the students uh, react to the learning of STEM disciplines or both? Could be either one. Right, you, the thing, the, the deeper world, the deeper term is so broad. You can study the direct impacts of what this intervention does for learning. You can study how they feel about that intervention. You can do both together. Right? You can do whatever you want. So it's just consider it to be like any other type of research you do. The questions you can ask are, are infinite. You can ask so many questions, but you're going to base the questions you ask on your observations, on prior evidence, on previously published works, right? So you're gonna be scientists about it, right? So make observations, read the literature, see what, oh, there's a gap here. I'm noticing something along these lines. Let's try to ask a question, design a question to address that. Another, yeah. another question. Uh, how do you connect uh, the, the disciplinary uh, learning with the context of the students or is not important? Um, what do you mean by the context of okay. the students? It's uh, important that, this, that the students uh, uh, apply the, the concepts of uh, the biology, for mm -hmm. example, to the social life. Uh, because I, I think that uh, the, the concepts uh, uh, are dynamic, are a dynamic uh, um, building. Mm -hmm. uh, so I uh, I ask uh, I, I I I think that uh, um, the the biology, for example, um, must uh, show to the students uh, how uh, solve problems in the context. Sure. Yeah. So again, if you want to study the, the solving of problems in that context as your research question, you totally can. I, I know people that are looking at, um, you know, when I, you might ask your students to get together and try to solve something, but they actually have little microphones there that are recording their conversations and then listen to them later to actually analyze what's going on in that group dynamic. So that's definitely something you can do if you're interested in that kind of question. Yeah. 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 Again, you can do really whatever with it. You know, as long as it's interesting to you. It might provide benefit to your students or classroom or to the larger research community advancing the field. So the possibilities to study different uh, elements of the deeper study yeah. um, uh, about uh, the behavior of the students, yeah. Yeah. about the concept in biology. Anything. Yeah. yeah. So just like your own uh, biological engineering, biochemical research, clinical work you're doing now, right? The, the questions you can ask are really limitless. It's just finding the right question that's hard. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, um, so types of data as well. So what types of data can we collect here? So we're going to have three broad categories, and then I'm going to let you loose to do some of your own here. All right, so we have quantitative, qualitative, and demographic. So these are my three big areas for data collection. And so quantitative data, that can be something like exam scores, homework scores, something that's called a pre-post test. So you might give your students a test at the, on the first day of class, see what they know. Then you give them a test, in the, the same test, in the last day of class, see what they know now. And that's a pre-post. And you can look for gains in learning or gains in knowledge there. So those are your quantitative metrics. Again, they're scores, they're performance values. There's a number on them. But now qualitative is a little bit different. So you can have surveys, written surveys. You can do interviews one-on-one. -on -one. You invite a student to your lab or your office to have an interview. You can do focus groups. So maybe we have the front row. You would meet with me together and we talk about a, a, an idea. I have a research question. I have things to ask you. Um, and these, these types of qualitative measures get on what we like to say the, the squishy topics. So these are things that are not easily measured like performance or scores or learning gains. Things like attitudes, emotions, values, perceptions, motivation levels. So all of these are, are again, squishier. They're not as easy to measure. 
oftentimes, especially if you're doing an interview, you're not going to have any numbers whatsoever. But there are ways to turn those interviews and that written data into numbers. There's ways to quantify qualitative data. Um, but generally, those are two pretty different categories. And then the demographics we've been mentioning a lot. So those are things that are basically about the individual. So gender, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, test scores, zip, or where you live, where you went to high school, all these things. These are all the things that make you you. And we can, again, control for those in certain models to try to um, not be fooled by our results. We want to have the, make the best conclusion we can based on our data. So these are the, some of the types of data you can collect. And what we're all working up here, too, for the rest of the time coming up is you're going to design your own study. So as you're going to, you're going to do that, you're going to kind of keep in mind the key factors to consider, the types of data you can collect, some experimental design considerations, things like that to help you put together your study. Okay, so we'll be working on that just shortly. So any questions on the type of data? All right. So, um, so, and one tip I have for you here is to make friends with a statistician. Um, just because whether it's the quantitative or turning the qualitative into quantitative, I mean, we just usually don't have the right training as scientists and engineers to do it. I mean, you can learn it. Um, there's, uh, do you know um, Coursera? The website Coursera that's like online classes? They, I, I took a series of them. Um, from Johns Hopkins to learn how to do statistical analyses in R for types of research like this. And they, so you can learn it, um, but having a statistician friend is even better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a question about how to make a good survey or interview. Okay, that's a whole other talk. That could be a whole other two hours, right? How, how to make a good survey or a good set of interview questions. So there are protocols that people recommend. Um, for the interviews, especially, there's interview protocols. Um, there's things called structured interviews, where you have a list of questions and you just go one by one, like no back and forth. Then there's semi-structured interviews, where you have a list of tentative questions you're going to start with, but if during the conversation something interesting comes up, you can follow up on that and go kind of on your own questioning route. Uh, but there are ways to kind of put together these questions well. Um, same thing with surveys. And in both cases, there's ways to what we call validate the data set to see if it's actually telling you what you think it should be telling you. So after you collect data with this survey, there's ways to look at the data to see if it's, in fact, valid or not. So yeah, but I, yeah, that's a, I can get you re references for that if you're interested. Okay, thank you. okay. Great. Okay. So um, I just want to share quickly an example of a, of a study of mine underway. And then just to give you a kind of putting all this together, and then you'll go and jump into your, your examples. So, um, so this is one that I, and these are the questions you're going to be answering next. We'll have them on the screen. So what's your research question or hypothesis? So I mentioned earlier about my engineering students versus my biology students and mine. So my question on the study I'm working on is how do engineering students feel about biology? Right? So, and that's, that word feel there is very intentional because I want to look at emotions in this case. We can look at other things, but here I first want to start off with how do engineering students feel about biology? If you don't like, if you don't feel strongly positive about something, if you dislike it, you feel hate towards something, you're probably not going to want to learn about it or do well in that class, right? So emotions actually are really important to consider. Um, what's my experimental design or study population? So I have uh, chemical engineering students at, at the Colorado School of Mines where I teach, and they'll be surveyed in class to measure their feelings. So in this case, I don't really need a control group. I'm just a assessing my chemical engineering students as a whole. How do you feel about biology? I'm not trying an intervention. I'm not trying a new activity to see if it works better than a control, right? So in this case, you don't need a control. This is just kind of a, this will be what we call a descriptive study. Are trying to describe our population. So then we have um, what types of data will I collect? Uh, and to answer my question, so I'm going to be collecting qualitative data on emotions from a validated instrument and also student explanations for why they answered the ways they did. So this is something to consider when you want to get into these squishy categories. 
So if you have a survey where they kind of rate on a scale of one through five, right? How much do you like something? How much do you, do you feel about something? That will tell you what they think, but it doesn't tell you why. So you can use these types of validated instruments or surveys, again, to figure out what's going on. But if you want to learn why, you either need to get them to write. They literally say, explain why you answered this way. And they write something down, or you have to do interviews or some other way. Right? So that gets you more into the why of their thinking. Just the survey itself will tell you what in those kind of scale type questions. But the why, that requires more, more work and more investigation. And then lastly, how will I analyze my data? What stats or methods are involved? So in this kind of study, what I'm going to be doing is what's called a mixed methods analysis, meaning it's a mix of quantitative and qualitative assessment. And the two things that I'll be using, which I don't expect you to know the specific terms for what you want to do yet, but the things I'm doing are what's called a factor analysis and something that's called thematic coding. So this is something that I, I kind of keep in mind when I'm putting together a study, right? What's my question? Who am I studying? What data am I going to collect? How am I going to analyze the data? Hopefully, this kind of flow might look somewhat similar to what you do in your biology lab, in your chemistry lab, in your physics lab, right? You're, you're following the scientific method while you're planning a project. You're, planning, you're basically putting a proposal together. Are you trying to figure out what are you going to do ahead of time? So that's, again, one. This is a project I'm currently working on. Um, and this, these are the kind of things you can think about to set that project up. This is very, you know, bird's eye view, big picture. There's a lot more detail that needs to be worked out. But for today, the rest of the time, I'm going to have you all work on trying to come up with your own study and work on your own um, research project that you might want to do. Um, and it's going to go along with these four questions. So any, any thoughts at this point? Any questions on mine that I put together? We'll have them do on paper. Oh, no, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is not so much related with this um, mm -hmm. example, but it's related with the evaluation of the students. Mm -hmm. So in Mexico, and I was reading in other parts of the world, the examination of the students is related with the homework or some mm -hmm. in-class participation, and the exams scores are not useful anymore to, to have the, the grade. So now, taking the faculty learning, do you believe it's possible to go back to the exam scores to really say that these students obtain or not the, the, the learning? Yeah, if the exams are not any good, is that what you're saying? If the exams are not really measuring what they say they're measuring, are they? Um, I'm not sure because yeah. I really believe an exam is important yeah. because it's where you really demonstrate what you know. But some people say that the stress and situation and sure, other things sure. could yeah. damage it. But at the end, you should demonstrate what you know in, at any moment. So with active learning, it's possible to go back to the, the exam scores. I mean, it, it's it's going to kind of depend on what that exam is. I think. So I mean, if it's a something that you wrote yourself and it's but it's a bunch of super easy questions and everyone's scoring 95% correct, then it's probably not going to be useful to, to distinguish between the students and based on the act of learning or not, right? So you want to make sure whatever assessment item you're using actually can differentiate between students, right? There should be some students scoring 100, and there might be some students scoring in the 50s, right? So it actually can differentiate. And therefore, if you try a new intervention, like a new active learning technique, then that exam might be able to pick up or measure um, pick, uh, pick up the signal of the active learning on that assessment. Um, the problem is if you're waiting for an exam sometimes, if that's at the end of the course, say the final exam, think about everything else that has happened before then. And if you're trying to say that one active learning activity that four weeks ago made a difference, that's really hard to say. No, I'm, yeah. I'm not saying it's the, the only way okay. to, to approve a, a course. But it's a way to, you already know which is your level. You already uh, classify mm -hmm. the okay. students. And then, at the end, just to know where you really are, take this exam and look at the, the real thing, what you obtain, and you already got in your brain. Yeah, I think that's possible then, yeah. yeah. I don't know if I answered your question that well, but I... <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
but yeah, but I think exams are a good tool, right? They because they're usually the high they're high stakes, so students are really trying to do well on them. And if you did something that would help their learning, hopefully that would pick up on that as well. Okay, so let's um, again now turn it over to you for the last half hour. So perfect timing. So what I want you to do is um, first on your own. So be creative on your own. Take a couple minutes by yourself on your paper and your notebooks. Try to come up with your own research question. Um, so what I'm going to have you do is uh, first do this on your own. So you all come up with your own unique your own unique design your own study, whatever you want to do. And then we'll have you get in groups of two or three, and we'll basically have you pick between each other's which one you think is like, most exciting. And we're gonna have you put them on big posters and put them on the room and we can walk around and check each other's out. Okay, so first uh, I want you to do it on your own. So try to come up with an idea that you might be interested in based on your own research, your own experiences, your own classes, your own teaching. Um, try to answer these four questions. You know, you don't have to be super detailed, just kind of big picture. You know, what am I interested in studying? Who's my population? What types of data can I collect, right? So kind of think about that. So try that on your own first. Take, take three, four minutes by yourself to try to come up with your own study. And then we'll have you come into groups. The research is about students or? Uh, this is the education. Yeah, so this is the students, yeah. So do this about students, right? This is your education research. Education, no, not, not my research. Or doing this on your education. On teaching. Oh, sorry. Okay. All right, so at this point, you should open the other. Pick one, pick one study and start putting it on your poster. Start putting it on your poster here. Again, get into your groups of two or three at a time. ideas about how designing a education study might be similar but different from a traditional science type of study and as, as you saw in here there's a quite a variety of what you came up with which is really great you had the more uh, kind of intervention based studies does active learning improve something uh, this one I thought was interesting does how close you live to different businesses affect your decision to go into a STEM field is that something you can easily do if you can measure that distance Right. Um, I thought this was interesting too, looking at cross university, so trying to think about even another level of complexity, trying to track students at two universities and see how they're relating and collaborating together. Um, but all of these are great ideas, which again, I hope gave you a, a sense of how this type of research is done, 
how you get started. Um, and if any of you actually go through with it, you know, please let me know, let Marcus know, and we can give you some more guidance to try to make it a reality. That'd be really fun to work together on it going forward. Uh, did you have any comments or questions based on what you saw from everyone's here to share? <laughs> no? Oh, no words. <laughs> okay, good, good. okay, so just to leave you with this, so this is just getting started, but there's usually a lot of other things to keep in mind with these studies. One is what potential confounding factors are there, right? So some of you are trying to control here for gender, previous STEM courses, all these other things, but you always have to think about how, what else could explain my results, right? What else could explain my data? What confounding factors are there? Um, again, collaboration, really important. Well, someone on our here already said they have a statistician friend, which is great, right? But, I, but try to think about who's on my campus, who's in my department that could help me out with these types of studies. Even if they're not going to help you do the work, maybe it's someone that would read the, read the results with you and give you feedback from a different point of view and see what they think about it. Um, oftentimes as well, if you want to disseminate or publish your work, your university might require human subjects protection or um, what's called an institutional review board. So you can do this kind of stuff in your class and do surveys, no problem. But if you want to share it with the greater population, with the greater community, you have to usually get students approval to use their data. You have to have consent. So you need to figure out at, at your university, do you need consent? Some, some studies don't, some studies do. So you have to get that approved usually before you do it. And then also, um, where do you want to publish? Where do you want to share your results, right? So um, as I mentioned in the talk today, there's lots of uh, Deberg journals out there that are specific for biology education research, engineering education, etc. Uh, you can go, there's conferences that you can present your results at. So think about how you want to share your findings with, you, with your colleagues. Okay. And then just to finish up, just wanted to say thank you again for your time and energy and enthusiasm with this today. Um, I want to thank a couple of my colleagues from Irvine, Brian Sato and Adrian Williams, uh, who we, we developed this workshop a couple years ago and we've adapted it for different contexts. So um, we're trying to spread the, the deeper uh, you know, gospel out there and let all of you know about how it works and how you can get involved. So, uh, but do please follow up with me. Um, you can email me directly, follow up with Marcos, he'll put you in touch with me. But um, again, I've had a great time here so far and um, really learned a lot and I hope you have too. So thank you guys. And um, just for time's sake, and we've had so many good questions and back and forth, let's just say maybe we start wrapping up and getting to the next thing. But um, we're, I don't know, where are we going? What's going on? You tell us, Marcus. Yeah. Yeah. So first, we want to thank you, and we are going to give you a certification. Oh. <laughs> thank you. That is awesome. What does it say? <laughs> workshop. Oh, the second intensive workshop of physical science. That's really cool. Oh, I have my name, too. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you, guys. That's great. No, thank you.